Welcome to Reimagining Liberty, a project of the unpopulist. I'm Aaron Ross Powell, and this is a show about the emancipatory and cosmopolitan case for radical social, political, and economic freedom. My guest today is Kevin J. Elliott, assistant professor of political science at Murray State University. He's the author of the upcoming book, Democracy for Busy People. And that's the jumping off point for today's conversation, which digs into what it means to be a good democratic citizen and what democracy demands of us. About eight months ago, I moved out of Washington, D.C. after living there for over a decade. And in D.C., everyone cares about politics all of the time. It's, you know, you you start conversations by asking opinions on appropriations bills. Uh, And moving out here to Denver, people don't. Most of my neighbors have lots of other things on their minds that are not what Congress or the president or the regulatory agencies are up to. Are they doing something wrong by not being as engaged in politics as those of us who lived inside the Beltway were? I don't think so. Uh, the way that, uh, that one of the sort of frameworks that I bring to thinking about democracy, and I think is very helpful for understanding um, political systems in large, complex societies, is that there's lots of different roles uh, available within any given you know, society. Um, and that also goes for politics. So I tend to think about um, a division of labor within uh, democracy, different kinds of roles that people play. The role of an ordinary citizen is going to be shaped by the institutional um, arrangement that they find themselves in. So the specifics of the democracy that they live in, they're going to have certain kinds of institutions that take their input in one way or other, and they uh, aggregate that, and they put it together with other kinds of inputs, and then it sort of outputs eventually a set of um, a set of decisions uh, somewhere down the line. Um, so, do citizens whose primary institutional obligations involve voting um, every couple of years, maybe every year, maybe a few times a year, depending on um, the jurisdiction that you're living in or the country that you're living in, for that matter? Um, It's difficult to say that somebody who's uh, saying, look, have the parties changed fundamentally? Is there a new party, um, you know, uh, on the field of political competition? No. Then I already kind of know enough to make the kind of choice that I'm presented with, right, in, in in, in my democracy. Um, but if you find yourself in a different position, if you do find yourself, you know, working at a federal agency, if you find yourself on the staff of a congressperson, well, you know, then you're occupying a different kind of role. You have a lot of other levers that you can reach to influence politics. And then it might behoove you to have more sophisticated um, opinions about things that might otherwise seem quite abstruse to someone whose only institutional um, obligations are voting uh, uh, in terms of their their sort of democratic participation. Voters often vote for bad stuff. Stuff that is harmful in, in various ways, make poor choices and so on. And it seems like, so it seems like maybe there are two ways that they can vote for something bad or two two reasons one might vote for something bad. One is, we'll call it like moral badness. Like they want the state to do something that is morally wrong, is is objectionable, and so on. But there's also a like unintentional badness in the sense that like I want to I want to end poverty, but I'm going to vote for this thing that is totally not going to end poverty and is in fact going to make it worse because I just have no idea what I'm doing. And it seems like quite a lot of bad politics flows from, well, quite a lot flows from both, but a lot of it flows from the latter. And that does seem, rectifying that does seem to demand knowing what you're doing, especially if you're placing trust in the parties might be misplaced because the party leadership or the decision-making process is systematically leading to the wrong kinds of decisions and so on, but you don't really know enough. So how do we square that with uh, 
what you just said about not really having an obligation unless you're, say, working for the agency or there are specific circumstances to overcome that kind of that, that learning curve for, for doing this well. Yeah, it's a it's it's actually extremely complicated. So 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 one of the things to think about when it comes to what do voters need to know um, is to understand again to sort of focus on you know what are the choices that are put before them and how much do they need to know in order to locate the better of of the options that that are put before them. So you could imagine citizens who are uh, debating like in ancient Athenian democracy, right, where you have. Um, Literally, the assembly gets together and they're like, you know, what should we do about this like water project or like, you know, where should we build the new city wall or something? Right. The debate can get very, very um, complicated very quickly. What kind of stone should we use? Right. So where the institutions of democracy are, are asking citizens to consider very detailed questions because the kind of input that they're going to be putting into the democratic process of decision making is this kind of detailed input. Right. Then they need to know more, essentially. Um, and I think that when voters in a representative system, right, they are tasked with a fundamentally simpler task. Now, does that mean that they don't make mistakes or rather that they do make, that they don't make mistakes? Of course they do make mistakes, right? I think that's, that goes without saying. And I think the kind of way that we can respond to these challenges. If we think that voters are systematically making bad choices or something like that, one of the ways of thinking about it is in terms of, well, you know, what should voters be doing differently? How should they be, you know, uh, uh, conducting themselves and policing their, their, uh, their, their beliefs or their information flows, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, there's also a question about, well, what kinds of inputs are we asking from them? What kinds of institutions are they uh, interfacing with? And can we change those? Can we make those better? Do we wanna plug them into a process that feeds them information, right? So some of these uh, deliberative institutions that you see being experimented with all over uh, the world, a lot of these processes are involve very long learning uh, periods. So citizens are put in the presence of experts and other kinds of sort of uh, information sources that then help them to later in the process reach more informed kinds of decisions. So if you want to transfer more power to those kinds of institutions, then you might end up with um, a fundamentally different kind of expectation for, for, for citizens, essentially. And so here I've just what just the one other point I'd make about this is that uh, I think people often um, think about citizens needing to know all sorts of complicated uh, sort of empirical knowledge and maybe social science knowledge in order to guide their decision making when it comes to voting. Part of my response to that is to say, well, they're not really given a huge menu of options. They're usually given a very simple set of options. And the other thing is that precisely because many of them don't pay a huge amount of uh, uh, attention to politics, when it comes to questions of method, right, you're sort of talking about how uh, it's not so much the goal, but the method that might be deeply flawed. Oftentimes, issues of method, uh, methods of or, um, questions of procedure are very much left up to um, representatives. So even if representatives say, well, I'm going to cut your taxes uh, in order to like bring about economic growth or something, right? They get it, a, 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 a representative might get in there and say, well, look, the goal is economic growth, but it turns out that cutting taxes right now isn't going to do that for whatever reason. But I'm going to do this other thing and I'm going to deliver the goal of economic growth. Are voters going to punish the, the, the representative for delivering on like the ultimate thing because they used a different means? I don't think so. And part of the reason for that, generally the, the answer to that is no, <laughs> um, in terms of like what we know about public opinion and, and voter behavior. But the more important thing is that the means, uh, vo voters who don't pay a lot of attention aren't often paying attention to, uh, to these questions of means. So if representatives promise to do something that's counterproductive and then do something else, voters not knowing about that is sort of fine, <laughs> right? Because what they ultimately care about is the goal. And if the goal is demonstrably attained or moved closer to or whatever, then voters aren't going to punish someone for like, well, you promised me you were going to cut taxes in order to bring about economic growth but you brought about economic growth this other way. So, so there's, there's a way in which citizens not paying attention actually helps to um, give representatives, this is one of these classic arguments for representative democracy. It gives representatives the um, discretion uh, and the freedom essentially to react to what they're seeing, um, to information that's harder 
harder to access and make policies that might be more difficult to explain um, directly to people who don't, you know, aren't in the policy weeds. So if part of the answer then to why voters don't need to become the weirdo policy wonks in the DC think tank scene or something is that they just, they have a constrained menu of choices to pick from. That seems to assume that among those choices are good ones. And we can think of situations, the classic is like, you've got the two parties to pick from and both of them can look pretty bad. And so do voters in then, in addition to having an obligation to pick among the available choices, do they have an obligation to demand better choices? And how do they know, unless you have that bigger picture understanding of everything, how do you know that the choices are bad such that you now need to demand better ones? It's a great question. Um, my, my first sort of thought uh, in response is, so, so I think there's a couple of things going on here. So one of the things is like, you know, what, what should voters do when the options are all bad? And so one thing, or well, all equally bad, let's be very clear, right? So like, you know, let's, which is very difficult. And you might think that that's actually a null set. There's actually no cases where they're perfectly equally bad. But let's let's say that, let, let's say that's the case. Um, there are some democratic theorists who think that having equally bad options actually kind of transforms the decision um, situation of a voter where they might think voters have some kind of obligation uh, to participate, to vote or whatever. Um, but when they're all equally bad, all of those obligations dissolve. And it's like, well, you just, you know, if everything is truly equally bad, then there's no point in you participating at all, in part because then you would be complicit or in some in some complicated way you'd be complicit in uh the evil that would be done by that um by by one of those choices so so one of the things going on there and then one of the responses to that would be to say well sure but how do you know that that badness is like persisting through time Part, one of one of my concerns and one of the things that i uh, emphasize is that um we we things change over time, right? Election to election, day to day, year to year. And if even if the options are equally bad in one election, there's no guarantee that they're going to be equally bad in the next one. So one of the things it seems to me that citizens need to do um, is that they need to keep tabs, essentially, on what's going on in politics, what's going on with the choices that they will be faced, in the, faced with in the next election. Um, uh, so there's some thinkers, some or some sort of philosophers who make arguments like it's, it might actually be better for people to ignore politics uh, because they're going to be in a they might be able to make better use of their time in a way that helps other people more efficiently, um, uh, more efficaciously if they take the time that they're attending to politics and, and actually direct it elsewhere. The issue with that argument is actually an epistemological one, which is that how do you know <laughs> that your choices in politics are not going to do more good than the choices you might make for doing philanthropic activity or something. The only way you can know that is by attending to politics and the choices that you might be faced in politics and the sort of consequences of what those choices might be. So it seems to me that democratic citizens always have a kind of obligation for to surveil politics, to keep tabs on politics, precisely to get the awareness of the quality of the, of the choices that they face. Uh, another part of the question uh, is was that like should they be demanding better choices? I, I think that's like a great question because that is precisely the kind of thinking that that moves us to think about institutions. Why do we only have two choices in the United States? Right. Um, I, I do this with my students when I teach them American uh, politics, American government. Um, I I talk about you know. Two-party systems versus multi-party systems. I talk about um, electoral rules because these kinds of things are very wonky and can be very uh, difficult for for sort of people who are not accustomed to thinking in terms of institutions to understand how these like abstruse. What does my ballot look like? Like, what what do you mean? There's multiple representatives in a district, right? Like these kinds of questions actually uh, culminate in a ballot that gives you choices, right? That are different. So. Should citizens demand better choices? I think the answer is yes. Um, do they need to know a lot in order to know to demand those better choices? That's a good, like, I think that's a good question. And um, 
one of the ways of thinking about an answer is to think about again in terms of a division of labor. So if you do have citizens who are engaged, who, who look at their choices and think these are bad, I think it is a sign of, of what they should be doing, that they should then follow up and try to figure out why do I only have these bad choices? Like, you know, and then that kind of leads them into this institutional design space where they begin to learn about right choice voting and multi-member districts and, and, and this type of comparative politics stuff. Do most people do that? No. Do most people think that this, that the choices that they're facing are sort of equally bad? I don't think so, actually, right? Are most people happy with the choices? I don't know about that either. But I do think there has been an increasing awareness among um, sort of ordinary people that we should be demanding better choices. And the movements that we've seen in states like Alaska and several others that have moved towards ranked choice voting, Maine, right? These are partly fueled by people precisely doing what it sounds like you want them to do is demand better choices. And then following that demand through to like, well, what does that mean? And it means, among other things, messing around with how we do elections, the, the, the sort of machinery of elections. On the epistemic issues, though, if if so, if a voter looking out at a set of choices thinks that they are maybe not equally bad, but is like, I'm sure that there could be a better choice out there than the ones that have been offered to me, even if one of them looks marginally better than the other. Um, but that that requires then that's that's a signal to the voter, okay, I should look into this more so that kind of I know what to demand. That seems to bring further epistemic complications in the sense of how do you go about figuring out where to go for that that information, given that there could be conflicting. I'm, so I'm thinking of my way of example. Years and years ago, when I was at the Cato Institute, I had a colleague who worked on climate change issues. And he was a PhD climatologist, you know, credentialed all of that, but his views of the severity of global warming, the causes and so on was very different from other climatologists out there. And I asked him, the question I asked him in the break room was I when I look at, say, like the evolution creationism debate, there are PhD biologists who argue for young earth creationism, and there are PhD biologists who argue for evolution. And almost all of us say, well, obviously the people who argue for uh, for evolution are correct, even if we're not ourselves scientists, right? We can just kind of know because there's this. So how how am I, as a non-climatologist, to evaluate the fact that Almost everybody who is as credentialed as you are disagrees with you. Um, and what? how should I, in my mind, distinguish you from the young earth creationist, effectively? And, and the answer that he gave was not satisfying. It was, well, because the data supports my side, which is you know what everybody who has a side argues, right? Like no one says the data doesn't support my side. But, but it was, I think it speaks to this, this question of, if I'm going to demand better choices, I have to have a way to evaluate, and either I can develop a high degree of expertise myself so that I can like look at all the available data and come to a reasonable conclusion. But that's not that doesn't work in almost all cases because we can't be experts at that level and everything. So instead, we have to basically lean on proxies, but the proxies disagree with each other. And so if you talked to, you know, if you said, I don't think that the choices in front of me for like solving this particular issue are good, and you talk, you go to the experts at one think tank who all look like very smart people with lots of education, they're going to say one thing. You go to the other think tank, they're going to say another thing. How does a voter answer that? Because it seems like we've just kind of have pushed the expertise question just down the road a bit. I think that's right. But one of the things is you're, you're pushing down the road, but you're also um, reducing the number of people who are engaging in the inquiry. So um, what do I mean by that? Uh, so I think part of what's happening here uh, when we begin to talk about better choices and, and so forth and reform, um, one of the things we're talking about is specialization, which is to say that some citizens will take it upon themselves that like in their uh, economy of attention and the kinds of things that concern them in politics, some of them will, as you, as we've been discussing, right, some of them will say, don't like my options, would like to like 
you know, learn more about what different options I might, I, I could have. And that could, right, should sort of, it's just sort of by hypothesis, will lead them to specialize in the sense that they will begin to, um, as you say, uh, move themselves into this debate space where there's people from Cato and there's people from, you know, whatever the other sort of think tanks uh, that are all doing work on whatever topic it is, let's say democratic reform, um, New America, I suppose, uh, and other, other places like that. And then the, and then they will begin to, as, as you say, you read the, the contrasting kind of opinions that, that, that they see. Um, and there will be at that point, right, as you say, conflicting claims from different kinds of experts. Um, one of the, th one of the uh, most important um, determinants of where people get their information, and you were sort of alluding to this, I think, uh, is trust, right? There are some people that we trust, right? That's actually where we get most of our information. We, there are some people, some sources that we trust, and those are the ones um, that we end up endorsing. Their views are the ones that we update our own information uh, uh, about. So I think one of the things that happens all the time out in civic society, in civil society, is that citizens are specializing in different issue areas that they find interesting. And not everybody does this, right? But some people do. And the ones who do will end up accumulating a bit more knowledge, a bit more expertise, but in a very, very light sense of expertise. They're experts relative to somebody who has never given any of these questions any thought. So someone who has read a, a series of articles uh, by Lee Drutman, for instance, somebody who's written quite a lot about electoral reform. You know, the structure of, of Drutman's writing about this is he is engaging in debates, uh, in, in arguments that other people are making who, you know, oppose the kind of reform package that he has in mind. So maybe you begin to read what he's saying and you're like, boy, this doesn't sound right to me, or this sounds un-American or something, or whatever it is. Um, maybe he'll convince you and maybe he won't, but in reading, you know, this Vox article or whatever that he's written, maybe he'll mention somebody that you're like, oh, who is that? And you search for their name or whatever. And this is sort of the process. And then you look them up and it turns out that they're more congenial to, to you you know, they're, have, uh, they're an advocate of two-party systems and they give you all sorts of reasons why they're excellent or whatever. Um, and in this process of exploration, uh, you, you, you come to have a much better understanding of this question that you started out with um, and also of the sort of um, state of play among people who pay very close attention to it and people who know a lot more about it than you do. And so I do think you end up with a, with a, a, a kind of specialization in the mass public that then helps inform reform efforts and politicians who are interested in this area of reform, they come to understand that the people who are invested in this area of reform have these kinds of, of, of opinions, not all of one piece because people disagree, but in general, people in the reform community, people who are interested in, let's say, better choices, you know, there, there has been like a herding towards, for instance, ranked choice voting as something that like many people are very, very interested in. There's one other thing about this particular question, and so other things won't work quite the same way. Maybe climate change wouldn't work quite the same way. Um, is there's a, a a difference between activists, people who are very committed to one particular reform, uh, and this can almost get to the point of like come hell or high water, right? This <laughs> this is what I've hitched my wagon to. Um, and then, and then there are people who are more disinterested and approach things in a more kind of eng engineer kind of approach. Um, you know, people in, in my field in political science, they tend to think about political institutions in this way, electoral institutions in this way. So if somebody comes to you and says, all right, how do we fix this pro Like, how do we fix our democracy? What's the best electoral system? Something like that. A political scientist will be like, well, look, there's no answer to that question. <laughs> what is the problem that you're trying to fix? Because all there are are trade-offs. All there are are imperfect solutions. There's no best system. And an activist will tell you, it's my preferred reform. That's the best one, right? Um, and so I think you can come to kind of um, note the difference between these uh, in the public debate about, in particular, political reform, when you see people who are like, oh, um, you know, my preferred reform is the solution for all of these problems. It's the silver bullet for everything. When somebody makes claims like that, you know, at some point it's like, is that is it really going to fix everything? Is it really the solution to all of the problems that beset us? Probably not. And here's this other person who's making, who's saying, look, 
it'll solve these problems. Maybe it'll make this slightly better, right? And then you're like, that person actually sounds more plausible, more believable. And that's, that's there you can have that kind of, um, that you can develop that trust relationship on the basis of, of something like that, right? Just like this person's making wild categorical claims and this person's making uh, more sensible claims. Let me flip to the other side of it because we've been talking about the the relative lack of expertise of most voters um, and and not just lack of expertise, but often just lack of interest in, you know, in all of the the political stuff. But then there are obviously people who are absolute politics geeks, love this stuff, obsess over it. It's all they want to talk about and so on. And those tend to be the people running the institutions, right? Like you don't decide to make a career out of something unless you're kind of into it. And so the career politicians, the career bureaucrats and so on are the people who are pretty into it. And one danger of, or I guess one thing that can happen when you're really into something is you can overestimate the salience of it. And and so is it a problem that that basically our politics and political institutions are being run by people who are perhaps so into politics that it's not – they have expertise, but they also overestimate the applicability of politics to basically every problem that they come across? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I uh... – I take this sort of dominance of politics by the politically, you know, interested. It's it's funny, right? Because many uh, this very common rhetorical trope among um, the sort of elect, uh, elected officials will be like, "Well, I'm not a politician, right?" You'll see you'll see this kind of move where politicians precisely precisely try to like disclaim uh, exactly the type of very deep, you know, bone deep, like, "Oh man, I'm like I love politics," right? <laughs> Anyone who said that on the campaign trail is like, "Nope." I can just turn off half the electorate instantly, right? Um, uh, and I do think, like, I think you're you're absolutely right that that many people who who uh, and this wouldn't only go for the sort of political class, but the class of extraordinarily um, uh, um, interested ci- citizens as well, uh, overestimate the as you say the salience of of little minor things, right? So um, many Americans would have looked at at, at uh, uh, pictures of uh, so this is we're recording this right after the State of the Union, and there were some uh, pictures of uh, members of Congress holding like a white balloon, um, right? And this is a reference to the, the the Chinese spy balloon, which was recently sort of in the headlines. Uh, but if you're not like following politics all that closely and you see a picture of like a member of Congress holding a balloon, right, in the Capitol, uh, like, what's going on here? I don't know what this is about, right? Because you kind of have to be paying attention to, to, to understand what what's being communicated with this symbol. Uh, and you absolutely, I think it absolutely does happen where, where people who are very much inside, as it were, inside the bubble will, will tend to overestimate like, oh my gosh, did you see the story in Politico, right? It's so, it's so, uh, dastardly. One of the brilliant, uh, elements of the satire of the show Veep. I don't know if you've ever watched uh, Veep. Um, but the, the brilliance of the satire of that show is often playing off of precisely this, this element where these, uh, West Wing kind of people are, are, are constantly like, oh my gosh, everything's on fire because somebody said something, you know, to a reporter and, you know, a minor comment is blown, you know, very, very far out of proportion for the people inside the, the administration. Um, I mostly think this is like mostly harmless, right? This kind of overestimation of salience is for the most part, like it's kind of filling the time of the political class. And maybe you'd think they could spend their time in, in better ways. That might be, right? It could be. Um, but, uh, the, the, the sort of the fact of the matter is that these, these matters do not actually reach the ears, as it were, of, um, these members of the public who don't pay as much attention uh, to politics. They're more focused on, you know, Look, like, you know, what are my taxes at? What is growth? What is inflation at? What is the, it, am I getting a better deal at work, right? Than I am, than I have been lately. Like, why is my, why is my company giving me like a good raise right now? Like, why is that happening? And it's like, well, they can look at the unemployment rate and they know that if you lose you, if they lose you, they're going to have a heck of a time replacing you. Um, so, uh, I, I so I, I should say that I am worried about politics geeks in general. Like, I am concerned about them because there is a way in which, um, people who are very, very concerned about politics can become myopic. And I think maybe this is part of the sort of in the background of your question. 
um, that they can, as you say, sort of overestimate the importance of politics, the salience of politics, maybe. Um, and you might think politicize things that are not, you know, sh aren't, aren't, shouldn't be, maybe, just put very simply. And I do think that's a very real concern. Um, and uh, f from the kind of perspective that I uh, endorse, this is, I think, one of the genius design elements of uh, representative democracy, as opposed to more participatory or direct forms uh, of democratic institutional uh, arrangements, precisely because people who want political power have to resort at some interval to people who are not paying as much attention to things. This creates an enormous amount of pressure on them to not lose touch, right? To not allow themselves to become so um, tied up with palace intrigue, right? That that term palace intrigue that we'll sometimes uh, talk about when it comes to like inside the White House type stories, um, right? Palace intrigue comes from like the monarchical past when you have kings who can completely disregard what is like happening in the streets because there is no institutional mechanism of feedback that's forcing them to pay attention to what the hungry Parisians care about or whatever. In representative democracy, the political class cannot get too lost in its own navel gazing structurally because those who do that will not be able to communicate um, in persuasive ways with voters, essentially. Um, and again, there's better and worse ways of doing that, right? So there's better and worse ways of, of, of forging that kind of connection uh, between representatives and uh, and voters, uh, citizens, ordinary citizens. Uh, and I'm not saying that like we've got this figured out by any, at all. I'm just saying that um, this particular kind of problem is a real one, um, but the, the, the nature of accountability via, elect via the electorate um, I think is a, is a very powerful structural way to prevent that type of um, overestimation, navel gazing, inward turn among the political class from getting out of hand. Um, that being said, there is one other issue with this, which I think speaks to your concern about over politicization. Um, and that's that, well, you know, representatives are also in a position to communicate directly with voters. So if they can convince voters that this issue that the voters thought initially was like not political, and they make a case that it is, right, um, voters might be persuaded of that and then support them for using the state or whatever to address some issue that like we might think is maybe not, um, wouldn't be well treated by politics. Yeah. And I think that's the crux of, of my concern is that politics and political institutions and the application of of political force are are tools for accomplishing ends in the world and for solving we identify a problem and then it might be that that can be solved through state intervention a new program some sort of application of of political influence but it might also be there are alternate ways we could be addressing this particular concern right um so we could housing is really expensive. Well, we could institute, we could set rent controls through state intervention, or we could just kind of let people build more housing. And those are both alternate ways that we can argue about whether one works better than the other, but they're like, they're different tools to use to address a articulated problem. And my worry is that the more that the political tool is being controlled by people who are obsessive about politics, and the more that we center politics in the perception of the general citizenry as like something that they should be paying attention to, something they should be engaged in, the more we uh, maybe just implicitly tell people politics is among tools, politics is privileged as a way to solve this. And that, that then kind of encourages potentially like overuse, which then spirals because the more it's used, the more people are incentivized to pay attention to it. And the more people who are really into it think they can do with it. And and so that's that's my ultimate concern is that if we we if we overemphasize it, then we can end up in this like cascade where we essentially crowd out the use of other tools that might work better. Yeah, no, that's a that's a an important uh, it's a really important um, point I think. And you know, I have a very expansive concern when I think of politics and when I talk about politics, I I, I do mean it quite expansively. I I, I do not. Um, 
uh, I, I don't think of it as like solely related to related to the state. I, I do think about it also in terms of sort of like community engagement and, you know, what are the problems in the place where I live? Um, and they're there, you know, that for many people, right, immediately cues up, well, you know, what can I do that about this problem, like in my church or, you know, in my club or whatever, right? Um, so, so I do think that that's, that's actually a really important part of, of politics. Um, there's this wonderful book that, that I think, uh, would, I think deserves more, um, attention. It's this book, it's a, I forget, the book is called something like Close to Home, um, uh, The Work of Avoiding Politics, um, by Nina Eliasov. And she's a sociologist. And she does this fantastic, uh, study of, um, uh, basically Americans. And what she's, what she's interested in is the way that, that what politics is and what politics isn't is constructed. It's like a constructed thing. So she, um, interviews, this, uh, these, this civically engaged group of, of women, uh, in Virginia. And, uh, it's fascinating. So, so they, they ask them, Hey, what kinds of issues are you concerned about? You know, what, what do you think about these? political issues, quote unquote, political issues. Um, and what do you think about these other issues? And, and, and these women have, have organized a, uh, a sort of grassroots civic society club, I suppose, to address something like, I think it's like drug abuse in their community, something like that. Um, and then they ask them, uh, basically, what about like pollution from the naval base that's literally near your home? And they're like, that's not close to home. That's not an issue I can I can do anything about. Um, so for for them, what seems like they can get their hands around are local issues. And then if you ask them, is this are you doing politics by collect by by um, by doing collective action to address a a collective concern? They would say no. We're not doing politics. But it seems like. Why would what, you could very just as well call that politics, as you say, a non-state response to a collective action problem, right? You know that you could conceive of that as politics. It's not obviously not politics, but anyway, Eliasov does this wonderful job of showing how um, we develop these these uh, uh, rhetorical tricks and tropes of putting some things into politics in order to make them things we cannot get our hands around, things that are beyond our agency, things that that we can safely ignore uh, even um, because they, that, they're they far away and so by definition are just like not, not of our concern as opposed to issues that are quote unquote close to home, um, which we can get our hands around, that we can do something about even if this involves contacting elected officials, right? So if you're talking to like local um, city councilors or something, right? About some, we need a we need a sidewalk in our neighborhood or something, right? Like somebody might not think that what they're doing is politics because what they're doing is like, oh, I'm just trying to like make my 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 neighborhood better, something like that. So I think that's like a really, uh, uh, part of the concern that you're articulating in terms of how politics can kind of grow too far, I think is sometimes can often be a, a verbal disagreements, right? So like, well, what do we mean by politics? Um, if we include all kinds of collective, you know, action, maybe you think that's over-inclusive. That's fine. <laughs> that's, that's okay. Um, if we want to like say, well, it's only about the state. I'm like, okay, well then I am not saying that people need to pay attention to the state. Um, I think that if people are concerned with um, uh, their, their role as democratic citizens and what that entails, among other things, is either being a voter or being a citizen in some other way. I think that there's lots of ways of being a good citizen. I do think you need to be paying attention to electoral politics because, well, we can get into that if you like, but it's it's a bit of a longer uh, point, but um, yeah. Well, let me ask them about electoral politics because we, so looking around at the American political landscape right now, um, few of us I think would label it healthy. Uh, that it's we are in often pretty scary times with you know particularly what we're seeing with the Republican Party and the drift that it has had away from the kind of when you talk about the role of legislators it's not they're not what I think you you mean you know in terms of how they're approaching their role and um, the direction they want the country and all of that but one of the things that happens 
that has happened in our political culture, and I think it's incentivized by the way that elections function, is is just extreme polarization and a a sense that the the people on one side are being told by the leadership on the other side that those guys over there are like, prof- are enemies are not citizens that we're sharing a common project with, even if we disagree on how best to achieve these shared ends, but rather they are, you know, they are more dangerous than any of these foreign invaders we might be worried about or something. Um, and all of our elections are built around that negative partisanship and so on. So how do we, how do you pay attention to elections in a environment like that where it seems like Everything that you would be paying attention to, unless you are just reading political science journals, is is like is designed to make all of these problems worse by entrenching the very things that seem to be causing the issues that that are, I mean, potentially tearing the country apart. Yeah, um, and uh, let me just say that I think I'm professionally obligated to say everybody should be reading more political science journals. <laughs> Um, but right no, uh, uh, yeah, no, I mean, th- this, this is a problem of the information environment, right? So the, the, the structure of the information environment, um, in terms of things like, uh, ownership in terms of the sort of rules of, of moderation, um, a, uh, 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 the affordances of online architecture. Uh, this is, uh, there's a wonderful book by, uh, uh, Jennifer Forstall uh, on this, on this, uh, question of sort of online, um, architectures that are uh, conducive to democracy and, and ones that aren't. I would highly recommend her work. Um, so, so this kind of stuff is, I think, really, um, <laughs> This is where we're at, right? The, trying to sort of grapple with these issues is is sort of where we're where where we are as people concerned with uh, democracy and healthy democratic uh, processes. I mean, I, you know, the the rise that we've seen uh, in in American uh, politics, in particular, in of independence. So, independents today are something like forty percent or more, between forty and forty five percent of of Americans now identify as independents. Um, and there's been some some really great work by some other political scientists. Here I am, political scientist. I'm going to like you know, cite a bunch of political scientists because I think that the, the, there is some some uh, they're starting to get to many of the issues that are at the core of what's going on here. Um, there's there's this great book called The Other Divide, uh, which emphasizes something that's been, been in the background of our conversation. But you know, here's a good place to make it explicit, and that's that you know we often talk about uh, the the main political divide is between Democrats and Republicans, left and right. Right? We, we're sort of all familiar with that. That's what you're alluding to in terms of polarization. But there is at the same time this other divide between people who are very invested in politics, right? People who are, who, who make it their their geeks, their make it their lives, and the people who just don't, right? The people who are just very often either very completely, very politically disengaged or, 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 or only sporadically so. Um, and, and one of the really interesting things is that the further away you get from that very invested uh, core of, of, of um, politically interested people, the cooler all of the sort of heat of politics gets. They're just not as invested. In, in the fights, they're not as concerned. They're 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 it, it, the the sort of the the heat of of partisan conflict just is like seems very alien, very strange. They don't quite get it because they're not invested in the same way. Um, and I think one of the things that's really important is is if we either as citizens or uh, the the sort of locus of where to do this is is, is tricky, right? Um, but basically, I think it, we do would do well. Um, to, to bear in mind that there are, this, there are these fundamentally different kinds of ways that people are oriented towards politics. People being less committed to it doesn't make their concerns and their interests any less significant. It makes they, they they're dealing with high inflation and and unaffordable health care and all these kinds of things just like everybody else. But they tend not to vote as often, and they tend not to be involved in these like deeper forms of, of political participation. And one of the things I think we should be thinking about when we think about democratic reform are ways that will essentially <laughs> empower people who are less invested in the partisan warfare, essentially. Um, and uh, that will help to sort of turn the temperature down because you have this more inclusive vision of who politics is about. It's not just about the people who are, who are you know, 
have drawn the long daggers, right, and, and are at each other's throats. It's also these people who are like, yeah, um, I don't really care about these conflicts. Like, you know, what are you doing about the you know price of whatever, right? What are you doing to, to help me out? Um, and I think that's very helpful, and I think that's very healthy, I should say. Um, but it is something, as you're saying, that we have there are structural elements of our of our politics right now that are militating against that. Um, and and I do think one of the places to look is information flows and the structure of um, of of the sort of ownership of media uh, uh, sources and, and the, these types of things. They end up having a lot of kind of downstream effects, right? The concentration of ownership of of radios and television stations and things like this um, has reduced the diversity of of perspectives that we'll see articulated in in public, and it helps uh, to to consolidate the stories that are told about our, about our collective life. Um, and I think that that's a problem. Um, but you know, is it, it, once you get this kind of polarized, um, train rolling, it is genuinely quite difficult to, to, to un, un, unpick that, um, that development. Um, for my money, I think the most, the most straightforward way of addressing that particular problem would be, Introducing reforms that would enable the formation of um, of, of third parties, essentially of, of multiple parties, because I think if you want to address the problem in the Republican Party in particular, I think what you need to do is you need to enable that party to split into a more moderate faction and a more extreme faction. I think that's what you, I think you want those factions to be separate parties, and they can agree on all sorts of policies in the House in the legislature. Issue to issue, right? But if voters were able to have a choice between the, what would be the America First Party and the sort of, you know, old line Republican Party or whatever, uh, the, cent the center right party, um, that would provide voters with a real choice on the right. And I think you would find that that center right party would often have enough support to be pivotal uh, in deciding whether what kinds of policies are actually made. But that requires the kinds of reforms that we've been discussing earlier. This is going to require diversifying the choices that, that voters face. This is going to require changing how we organize our elections. But these are, these are not changes that we know nothing about, right? Lots of other countries do things differently. And there, I think the, 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 one of the big challenges for American democracy is how can we kind of set aside, um, the, our, our very strong sense of American exceptionalism that we have nothing to learn from the rest of the world? How can we kind of set that aside in order to kind of, um, learn what we can learn from, from other countries' experience and say, well, look, you know, what can we do here? How can we change things in a way that will, um, provide us the opportunity to do things better, basically? Thank you for listening to Reimagining Liberty. If you enjoy this show, please take a moment to rate and review it on Apple Podcasts. You can also join our Discord listener community and book club by following the link in the show notes. Reimagining Liberty is a project of the Unpopulist and is produced by Landry Ayers.